Good morning. Welcome to the Bell and Pollock Legal Show. We're here to talk to you about legal matters. I'm Brad Pollock. We have Kevin Carlock in studio. We've been doing this show for about the last five years. We're going to talk to you in the next half an hour concerning legal principles, matters that might apply in um, your lives or the lives of your loved ones, people who are close to you. When somebody gets hurt in an accident, gets hurt in an injury situation, uh, they need to know what their rights are. They need to know what they can do. Uh, you can't fall for, and you should not fall for some of the some of the um, statements that are being made about how we can immediately value your case, or how we can we can immediately get you millions of dollars. Well, how everything's going to be just wonderful, and you're going to walk through uh, the legal system without any problems. That's not the way it works. People who are holding out those uh, what I would call quick buck. Um, uh, promises are people that you want to be very cautious of because you've got a problem when you start thinking that anything is easy. You're dealing with uh, people who have caused you harm, who have caused wrongful death, who have caused injury. You're dealing with insurance companies who represent those people. Those insurance companies are not likely to just start peeling out and forking over money. You need a legal game plan, and that's what we do. We put together get legal game plans. We sit down, we talk to you, we tell you about what your rights are. We will help you value your case, but we help you value your case in a reasonable approach, not with a quick text me and I'll give it to you or come in right away and I'm going to let you know what it is. We don't hold out these promises of, hey, guess what? There's all sorts of money out there and, and you're going to get all sorts of recovery. Your case is different than every other person's case. Um, every lawyer, when Gary and I have had our firm together for, for th- over 30 years. We've been, uh, we've been doing personal injury cases for over 30 years. We have multi-million dollar verdicts. We have multi-million dollar recoveries, just like all the other lawyers. But your case is, is, is a case that has to be looked at in the unique set, set of circumstances that apply. We need to look at your case like every other case we look at, which means we, we, we look at it with regard to you. We're not a settlement mill. We're not a law firm mill where we churn them in and churn them out. And maybe you won't even talk to a lawyer. I mean, you won't have a fair chance to get maximum value for your case. We take our cases to trial if they need to go to trial. We've been trying cases in our law firm since it was established in 1984. Things aren't going to change. If a case needs to be tried, we take it to trial. If it can be settled in the best interest of our client, we settle it. Um, that's what personal injury law is all about, and that's what personal injury cases are about. We have a, um, a another show on KHOW 6... 30 on the radio's dial that you can uh, you can l- listen to on Saturday mornings if you have questions about non-personal injury or personal injury matters, any kind of lo- legal questions, you can call us up on that radio station, on that show for that hour, and we'll talk to you about your personal cases. We'll talk about you, uh, we'll talk about any kind of case you've got. So that that's what we're all about. We're, we're we're known as Bell and Pollock PC or Champions of the People. That's how you can look us up on the internet. We have an interactive website. We can talk to you while you're on the website. We can get you in for an appointment, or we can uh, you can listen to our radio shows and our radio broadcasts that we do both Saturdays and Sundays. So you can listen to topics that have been discussed. Today we're talking about wrongful death. We talked about it last week. We're going to talk about it again this week, and we're going to finalize the wrongful death um, uh, process next week. Wrongful death, a, a very bad subject, a subject that is, is very difficult to deal with. It's a, a subject that no one wants to really deal with when we're, uh, when we're um, uh, facing the death of a loved one because of the negligence or the fault of another party. Um, is there recovery available? And if so, what kind of recovery is it? Personal injury lawyers deal with wrongful death and personal injury lawyers have to know about wrongful death cases. Um, we have a conflicts of law principles in the state. Well, I'm picking up from where we were last week. So if you want to catch up, get to our website, championsofthepeople.com and listen to the wrongful death part one. And, and then you can listen to this one. You can listen to this one and fill in the blanks from the past and listen to next week. Or if you've listened to both weeks, thank you very much. And, uh, please continue listening. Um, we talked about conflict of law principles a little bit last week, as in what happens, what happens when, uh, a, a father 
is on a business trip to Colorado. He lives in Georgia with his family. He's got a wife and two kids. He lives in Georgia and he comes to Colorado. He comes to Colorado. Um, let's say it's not on a business trip. Let's say it's to visit a relative. And while he's here, he is killed in a car accident that has been caused by an at fault party here. Question is what law will apply? Who's going to what, 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 state is going to take jurisdiction over the case. And our state, the state of Colorado, has said that a wrongful death case, the law that's going to apply the, and is most applicable is one with the most significant relationship with the occurrence and the parties. And you're going, well, that's real good. That doesn't answer the question. And in a lot of ways, it may not. The most significant relationship with the occurrence and the parties. That tells us, and, and when I'm talking about this scenario, you might be thinking also about a trucking company that is stationed out of another state that comes into this state. Bus companies are coming to the state where accidents occur. And, and you, you got to have lawyers who understand and recognize right out that there might be a question about what law applies. Now, we have another question about who may bring for wrong, the wrongful death claim. And Kevin, when we talk about who may bring a wrongful death claim, uh, what are we talking about? What are the what are the things we need to consider? Well, you've got three groups that are entitled to bring a claim on behalf of a person that dies as a result of someone else's negligence. Number one is the spouse, the spouse of the person that's passed away. Number two, that is the heirs of the person that has passed away. And by heirs, we mean lineal heirs. And we'll get into that more, in more detail in a minute. And third... A designated beneficiary, meaning that uh, someone who's maybe doing some estate planning can enter into an agreement with someone else and say, okay, in the event of my uh, death, you are the person that I want to um, pursue my wrongful death claim. That doesn't necessarily have to be someone who is a spouse or heir, but for that person to pursue the claim, there needs to be something in writing saying, okay, you are my designated beneficiary. So when we start talking about the groups, let, let's talk to you. The spouse could be easy, but with, with the um, civil unions right. and with common law marriage and with the different ways a person can be, quote, a spouse versus a non-spouse, that starts creating some questions right there, doesn't it? It really does. And Colorado is one of something like, I think it's like nine states that have common law marriage. And that's going to be a situation where maybe someone doesn't have a marriage certificate, but if two people are holding themselves out to the public and living as husband and wife, that is a circumstance where that person may be able, may be considered the spouse under state law, even though there's no marriage certificate. Now, what you have to remember, this is important because if in fact it's established that there's a spouse within the statute, it's going to be considered a spouse. You've just excluded certain people from being able to bring a claim. That's right. And if someone is unmarried and doesn't have children, that the parents of that decedent can actually bring a claim. So that's a fourth group. And that, um, that's going to apply once again where there is no spouse and no heirs. What's important to remember is, is if a person is married, considered married, and the the spouse does not want to bring a claim, then the parents of the deceased still can't bring a claim ever. So by virtue of the very fact of being, quote, married, the simple matter of being married, that's going to place it. Uh, that's going to disqualify the parents from even being able to bring a claim. So when you start talking about, OK, well, the first thing we have to establish in a wrongful death case is was the deceased married? Now, the, the Colorado legislature in CRS 14-15-107, 14-15-107 has expanded, has expanded the term spouse to include civil unions. All right. So, so now we're talking about whether or not the person is entered into a civil union. Uh, that, that, if, that in and of itself can cause and can result in uh, you having to think twice about what, um, uh, whether or not the person is, uh, did a formal civil union 
whether the person did a common law marriage or whether the person was married outright, whether the person divorced, was the divorce final, were they living separated but not divorced, separate and apart as if they're divorced, believe they have no further relationship with their spouse, but they've never gotten a legal divorce. In that case, what's going to happen, Kevin? That person is still the legal spouse, and they are entitled to bring a claim. And once again, that's going to exclude the parents of the deceased from bringing a claim. And it's also going to not exclude, but delay heirs from bringing a claim. All right. Now, then you talked to uh, Kevin. You said the second class is lineal heirs, right? Right. And by lineal, you got to go straight down the family tree. You can't branch out. You're talking about kids and grandkids. Nieces and nephews are not heirs under the statute. So if you've got somebody who maybe doesn't have any kids but has a niece or nephew, that person cannot bring a wrongful death claim on behalf of that deceased um, deceased person. Now, let's say let's say you've got a person who's who was married, had children, divorced, remarried, has children from the other marriage. Now we've got children from another marriage. Death occurs, and we start saying, "Okay, who's going to have what rights?" First rights are going to go to the spouse. Right? That's right. Second rights are going to go to the children. However, the children can't start their claim until the spouse has had a period of time to begin the lawsuit. That's right. We, with, with a wrongful death claim, you've got a two-year statute of limitations. And that first year belongs exclusively to the spouse. The If there is a spouse, the heirs cannot sue during the first year. It's the spouse's exclusive right. And a lot of times, Brad, you'll see uh, frustrated heirs uh, calling a law firm saying, you know, uh, my father passed away, but um, his wife is just sitting on this. She's not doing anything. But and she for, can. The, for the first year, that's, she, that's the spouse's right. They don't have to do anything. And you're listening to the Bell and Falk Legal Show. Uh, we're talking to you about wrongful death, the rights of the parties who have had a loved one pass away, be, has been killed by a non-fault party. We're going to take a short break and we're going to come back and talk to you a little bit more about uh, the timing of the wrongful death claim and what you need to be able to do under the Liability Act to be able to pursue your claim. Ready for an extraordinary lunch? As fast or as slow as you want it? With all fresh ingredients, Caitlin's Restaurant has it all. Express lunches that won't keep you waiting. Or, if you prefer, lunch served in that old-fashioned homemade style. All made fresh on the spot. Whether it's a fresh-made sandwich with homemade chips, quesadilla loaded with cheddar or jack cheeses, or scratch-made soups, you'll find everything you love at Caitlin's. Caitlin's is located on Mississippi just east of Colorado Boulevard next to Bookie's. How about green chili chicken stew? Think about a variety of fresh-made sandwiches or 11 different kinds of burgers made to order with one half pound of the finest USDA choice lean ground beef. You might favor a homemade New Mexican recipe with carne adovada burritos, chicken enchiladas, carnitas burritos served with hash browns, special recipe beans, cheeses with guacamole and your choice of homemade red or green chili sauces. For those who prefer the lighter side, there are fresh made salads and lighter fares. Sure to delight. Try Caitlin's for lunch or breakfast on Mississippi just east of Colorado Boulevard next to Bookie's. Call 303-798-6600. You'll love it every bite of the way. When a driver chooses to violate a safety rule, everyone on the road is in danger. That means you, me, everyone. Driving and dangerous choices. Think about it. The only allowable choice is the safest choice. Otherwise, you and your family are put at risk, in harm's way. This is really what car crashes are all about. One driver makes a choice that violates a safety rule. Everyone else is needlessly put in danger. In danger of injury, medical bills, surgery, lost jobs, quality of life changes, and future expenses. All it takes is one driver and one dangerous choice. I'm Gary Bell of the law firm of Bell & Pollock. We've been representing injured victims for over 25 years. We can help you put your life back together again. We'll fight the insurance company who defends those who injure you and your family, those who make dangerous choices. At Bell & Pollock, we are experienced injury attorneys who care about you and your family. Reach us at bellpollock.com or championsofthepeople.com or call us at 303-795-5900. That's 795-5900. One call, that's all.
Welcome back to the Bill and Paul Legal Show. We're talking to you today about wrongful death, the rights when you've had a loved one killed at the hands of an at-fault party, someone who's been negligent and has caused a loved one to be to be killed. We've talked about uh, this this whole topic last week. We talked about caps. We talked about limitations. This week we talked. We got into depth about the classes of people who can bring a claim. We've talked about the classes being first the spouse, then the lineal heirs. What's the next class, Kevin? Well, a designated beneficiary, and again, that's a person that you can come to an agreement with to bring your uh, wrongful death claim. And again, that um, that takes a certain amount of planning on behalf of the deceased person. Unfortunately, that's not a um, situation that we see too often just because some people don't have um, – planning in place for, for these kind of events. You know, we talked about the timing of the lawsuit, uh, the timing of the claim, if you want to bring it. The timing of the claim is pretty simple. You have a two-year statute of limitations. The first year belongs to the spouse. Nobody can infringe on that first year. You've got to wait for the spouse to take action. If, they, if the spouse doesn't take action, then the other people who might have a cause of action under the statute can bring their claim. But now we talk about liability under the act. And when we start talking about liability under the act, what are we talking about, Kevin? Well, just what you have to prove as a plaintiff in a wrongful death claim. And you're going to have to prove that the tort fees are negligently caused the death of your loved one. Now, what what's important to remember here is that um, the at-fault party is going to maintain any affirmative defense that they would have had just the same as if their negligent act had not killed the deceased person. And that includes things like comparative negligence. How is that important? Well, that means that you're going to have to look not just at the actions of the outfall party, but the actions of the decedent, the person that passed away. If there's a situation where the um, decedent did something negligent or contributed to an incident that... um, it, at least in part, maybe cause their own death. You're looking at a situation where that at fault party can and will try to blame the deceased person for their own death. So now that becomes a very, a very interesting question because let's talk a little bit. I, I'm driving down the road and I get hit by somebody and it causes my death. We would say my wife gets to bring the lawsuit. Now, what happens if I'm partially at fault, if I'm partially negligent in my driving that's co- contributed to the accident? Let's say I'm 20% at fault. Well, Brad, if you're 20% at fault, 20% of that negligence is attributed to you. And if the jury enters a damages award in favor of your heirs or spouse, 20% of that award goes away. So my wife is straddled with that 20% negligence in, in the operation of my vehicle. And that, that sounds pretty simple. Everybody goes, well, that makes sense. You know, if you if you cause your own death or cause 20% of your death, 20% is removed. Let's talk a little further. Let's say I'm driving down the road and the accident is 100% the fault of the person who ran into me, but I'm not wearing my seatbelt. Now what happens? Well, with respect to that seatbelt, you lose a category of damages. And in a wrongful death case, those are non-economic damages and those are big. That's right, because a lot of times the damages and the only damages you're going to be entitled to recover in the wrongful death, if you were not dependent on that person who died, is going to be the non-economics. And we'll talk probably next week, if we have time, we might talk about it a little bit here, but I doubt we'll have time. We'll talk about the Shalatium statute versus the, the, uh, the recovery for grieving but the point of it is, is a lot of that's going to be lost if, in fact, I'm not wearing my seatbelt. That's right. That's an affirmative defense. Yep. And this is all because wrongful death is considered a derivative claim. It is it is derived from that deceased person. It's not a direct claim from on behalf of those survivors. So because of the derivative nature of the action, the defendant does maintain all of those affirmative defenses. You want to think about that when a person is killed as a result of a slip and fall when they haven't been paying attention to where they're walking or when they um, are killed because of uh, drinking too much alcohol. All these affirmative defenses are going to come back at them and are going to be something that they have to be worried about. 
And as long as we're talking about it and we're in that area, let's talk about the damages. What are the types of damages we're talking about, Kevin, that you're entitled to in a wrongful death claim? Well, we touched on non-economic damages a little bit, but with respect to economic damages, that is pecuniary loss, what we call pecuniary loss to that spouse or minor child. Those are benefits, monetary financial benefits that the spouse or heirs would have expected to receive from the deceased person had he or she lived. So think about it. To begin with, this is a very uh, complicated area. To begin with, on economic damages, there's no cap. There's no restriction on how much, but the damages can be recovered only by the decedent's dependents, usually a spouse or a minor child. Right. So if we're talking about parents, say you've got a decedent with um, with no spouse and no heirs, the parents can bring that wrongful death claim, but typically parents aren't dependent on minor children. So that's going to be a situation where the plaintiff in that case might not have any claim for direct economic loss. Now, at that point, you're left with maybe funeral expenses. If the right. parent paid the funeral expenses, if the parent didn't pay the funeral expenses, of course, that's not recoverable. As well as the financial benefit, the plaintiff and those the plaintiff represents, but the plaintiff might reasonably have expected to receive from the decedent if he or she had lived. And that's when you start trying to get into, okay, how are you going to figure this out? You've got to base it on the decedent's life expectancy, the decedent's health, age, ability to earn, um, the probable life expectancy of the plaintiff and the disposition of the deceased to provide pecuniary assistance and aid to the plaintiff. What do we mean by that? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. You're, you're, uh, essentially asking, okay, was this person, uh, inclined towards helping the plaintiff and you're getting into someone's subjective feelings and intents and it, Obviously, that's not a person you can question on the witness stand. Yeah, because we start talking about a deceased person who owed child support but never paid their child support. So the child support is 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 in arrears. Now, we know by law that child is entitled to child support, but we also know we have a person who is not inclined to financially take care of that child because they didn't pay their child support. Now, by law, you're probably going to be able to go in and get the child support the back child support, because that's a past obligation out of the out of whatever recovery there is. But the child may not be able to get what we call future child support and future income based on a question or an argument of, look, this person wasn't inclined to support this child, or at least that amount may be very much restricted to just what the child support order was. Yeah. Leaves it very, very confusing. Talk about another one. You got parents that, uh, you know, you can have the parents of a very rich person, but if that rich person never gave any money to the parents, didn't have a relationship with the parents, wasn't helping the parents in any way in their economic needs, even if this person had a whole lot of income, the deceased, and the parents have next to nothing, you can't just assume that that deceased person was going to start paying money to the parents. So what are you left with? You're left with a very, very significant area that you have to explore to learn exactly what might be the recovery. So then we get through the economic damages. Now, the funeral expenses and things like that are stuff that quite often can be determined. But the question is, in a wrongful death claim, not a survivor action, but a wrongful death claim is the person who paid the funeral expenses going to be able to say, I'm entitled to those funeral expenses? There's a good chance they're not going to be entitled to those funeral expenses if they don't fit within the proper category of those who can bring the lawsuit. That's not going to happen. So now we talk about non-economic, Kevin. What's non-economic damages? Non-economic damages include grief, loss of companionship, pain and suffering, and emotional stress. Those are the classic non-economic damages that you are going to have in a, in a wrongful death. These are the human losses, the emotional losses due to, uh, that are suffered by the plaintiff due to the loss of a, of a loved one. Are there caps on it? There are. And these caps, you know, get, get adjusted for inflation. And right now the caps at about $436,000. And that is total. 
if you've got multiple defendants that are responsible for the uh, death of a person, you can't get that 436000 against each defendant. It is total for each death. All right. Now, now you got to stop and think about that. What are we saying there? We're saying that it doesn't matter how many people you sue and, and how many people you claim are responsible for the death. And it doesn't matter how many children there are. They're only going to get one award of the cap amount if, in fact, you can prove the cap amount. Right. Is right. that cap amount automatic? Oh, no. There, there, there is something of an automatic number, and that's called a salation. Okay, and but, what's that mean? What's the salation mean? Well, salation is something you can ask for in lieu of non-economic damages. You have two options. You can go to court, and you can try to prove your non-economic damages with evidence and testimony and put it in front of a jury and hope that the jury gives you a good figure. Your other option is to go for a salation, which means that you all you have to do is prove the liability Prove the negligence, prove the causation, okay? And then the court is automatically going to enter you a salation award, and that stands at $87,210. Oh, now that salation amount isn't a, isn't a bottom amount. If you decide not to go for salation and you decide to go for economic damages and more than salation, you could get less than the salation amount. You could get zero. And you could be in and out saying, boy, I should have gone for salation because it's not a guaranteed minimum. It's just another alternative way you can look for economic damages. The legislature is saying we don't want to necessarily make a spouse or a child have to get on the witness stand or go through a lawsuit and, and go through the pain of having to relive the death of their father or their mother or their, their husband or wife. So they give another way that you can determine some damages, a minimal amount. But if you decide not to go that route, you're not going to be facing the ability to necessarily collect the salation amount. You've been listening to the Bell and Pollock Legal Show. We're the only show of its kind. We talk to you about personal injury matters. We are personal injury attorneys. Brad Pollock and Kevin Carlock have been talking to you this week about this. We're going to take a short break and come back and talk to you about one more minute and wrap this up. And we'll do part three next week on the wrongful death statute. Ready for an extraordinary lunch? As fast or as slow as you want it? With all fresh ingredients? Caitlin's Restaurant has it all. Express lunches that won't keep you waiting. Or, if you prefer, lunch served in that old-fashioned homemade style. All made fresh, on the spot. Whether it's a fresh-made sandwich with homemade chips, quesadilla loaded with cheddar or jack cheeses, or scratch-made soups, you'll find everything you love at Caitlin's. Caitlin's is located on Mississippi, just east of Colorado Boulevard, next to Bookie's. How about green chili chicken stew? Think about a variety of fresh-made sandwiches or 11 different kinds of burgers made to order with one half pound of the finest USDA choice lean ground beef. You might favor a homemade New Mexican recipe with carne adovada burritos, chicken enchiladas, carnitas burritos, served with hash browns, special recipe beans, cheeses with guacamole, and your choice of homemade red or green chili sauces. For those who prefer the lighter side, there are fresh made salads and lighter fares. Sure to delight. Try Caitlin's for lunch or breakfast on Mississippi, just east of Colorado Boulevard next to Bookie's. Call 303-798-6600. You'll love it every bite of the way. When a driver chooses to violate a safety rule, everyone on the road is in danger. That means you, me, everyone. Driving and dangerous choices. Think about it. The only allowable choice is the safest choice. Otherwise, you and your family are put at risk, in harm's way. This is really what car crashes are all about. One driver makes a choice that violates a safety rule. Everyone else is needlessly put in danger. In danger of injury, medical bills, surgery, lost jobs, quality of life changes, and future expenses. All it takes is one driver and one dangerous choice. I'm Gary Bell of the law firm of Bell and Pollock. We've been representing injured victims for over 25 years. We can help you put your life back together again. We'll fight the insurance company who defends those who injure you and your family, those who make dangerous choices. At Bell and Pollock, we are experienced injury attorneys who care about you and your family. Reach us at bellpollock.com or championsofthepeople.com or call us at 303-795-5900. That's 795-5900. One call, that's all. Welcome back to the Bell and Pollock Legal Show. You can talk to us at any time about your personal injury cases. This is Brad Pollock. Kevin Carlock is in the studio with me. You can talk to us at any time by calling us at 
800-500-5900. Contacting us at championsofthepeople.com or bellpollock.com. Next week, we'll talk to you about felonious killings. We'll talk to you about other parts of the wrongful death statute. You've been listening to the Bell and Pollock Legal Show. Uh, we bring this show to you every week. We're happy to do it. We want you to be educated on your rights, and we want you to understand the real parts of personal injury law, not the not the promises that you hear on the radio all the time or on TV when people get up and talk to you about all these these claims to try and suck you in to give you their case. You've been listening to us. You can contact us at bellpalk.com, championsofthepeople.com, or 303-795-5900. All stay safe until next week, and we'll talk to you then. 